To appreciate Stalker, you have to transport yourself back to the year 2007. I know this will be a difficult enterprise for you goldfish gamers out there who don't have any long-term memory, but at least fake it for a minute. In 2006 and early 2007, the best the FPS genre had to offer was games like Black, Half-Life 2 Episode 1, and Call of Duty 3. None of these are bad games, except Black, obviously, but they're pretty much standard issue. The point is that in the burgeoning world of mainstream action-adventure games and mission pack sequels, Stalker was like a dark back alley on a crowded street still hanging out below the radar, as GSC Game World games were used to. Stalker was a PC exclusive, and hard to run at that. The most powerful computer I had access to at the time was my laptop, a Dell Inspiron E1505 that I bought in 2006. Stalker did not run well. I could tweak it enough to be playable, but it crashed a lot, which was frustrating, but not frustrating enough that I didn't devour it start to finish several times. It's hard to explain why I love Stalker so much, despite the roughness and crashing. Part of it is the setting. The Chernobyl exclusion zone is fascinating, like a little pocket of the apocalypse that exists on Earth right now. The full scale of the Chernobyl disaster is fascinating and chilling. I highly recommend the documentary The Battle of Chernobyl if you want to get a feel for the disaster and cleanup efforts. At the time of its release, Stalker had been vaporware since 2001, and it started life as something entirely different. Oblivion Lost, a sci-fi action game, but with some of the same gameplay ideals, outdoor levels, etc. Oblivion Lost may have begun life as a sequel to GSC Game World's freshman outing, Codename Outbreak. In 2002, the setting changed to the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, and the name changed to Stalker Oblivion Lost. Over the course of development, the game got hugely complicated, and by the time it came out, it had been pared back down again. Stalker was GSC Game World's dead cat bounce. Before the release of Stalker, the company was floundering around with some weird games that never really went anywhere. Their Cossack series of RTS games, three games and three expansions, including the American Revolution spin-off in a span of four years, was probably their best effort, but never achieved the success of, say, Age of Empires 2, nor should it have. They also made a Cossack spin-off called Alexander to tie into the 2004 film that nobody remembers, or at least not fondly. A year before it was finally released, two members of GSC bailed to start their own company. No big deal, except these guys were responsible for a healthy portion of Stalker's X-Ray engine. That's my personal theory as to why Stalker was such a buggy mess on release, and after patching, and remains so to this day. I don't have all the facts, obviously, so this is just speculation, but it certainly fits. Stalker feels like a finished game built on an unfinished engine. There was a huge amount of cut content from the game. Many enemy types, weapons, entire areas, factions, missions, storylines, you could even drive vehicles at one point. Some of these were restored in the follow-up games Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, and some mods even used the content as a jumping off point. Honestly, some of the cut content is for the better. A few boss fights with super mutants wouldn't really have improved the game. They actually feel somewhat out of place when added back in by mods. The real tragedy is some of the most expansive environments of the game going almost unused. The development team took trips to the Exclusion Zone, also known as the Zone of Alienation, to get the look and feel of the area right. The city of Pripyat and the area around the power plant themselves are huge and feel authentic, but they're only visited during the final madcap sprint to the finish, and there aren't any side quests or exploration to do there. The localization work is also spotty. The best example is when you're told to find somebody's rifle in a basement, which is difficult because the rifle is a shotgun and it's in the attic. The acronym STALKER stands for Scavenger, Trespasser, Adventure, Loner, Killer, Explorer, Robber. That's really dumb, so I'm going to move on and not bring it up again. I'll try to do my best to sell you on Stalker if you haven't played it, because believe me, you should. The appeal of the game is the unparalleled atmosphere and the sense of discovery around every corner. In the distant year of 2011, you play as the Marked One, an amnesiac stalker who is rescued by a traitor near the border of the zone. In your PDA, which for you young folks is like a really terrible smartphone, are instructions to kill a stalker known as Straylock. In this alternate history version of the zone, there has been a strong military and scientific presence conducting research since the reactor meltdown in 1986. In 2006, a second, larger explosion created the zone and the anomalies. Anomalies in Stalker are a very unique type of environmental hazard. Some are pretty much just simple elemental traps, like lightning, fire, and acid spots. Some send out a shockwave, which deals damage, but the really terrifying ones suck you in and hold you in place for the three or four longest seconds of your life before ripping you into pieces. And lastly, there are pockets of radiation. Unfortunately, radiation in the Stalker games is mostly used as a fuck you zone to keep you from trying to escape the level or climb on things you shouldn't. 
There aren't many situations where you have to take some rads in order to complete an objective or get good loot. Radiation is a sign that you're on the wrong path and should just leave. Near the anomalies, you find artifacts floating around. Artifacts can be sold for cash or equipped to provide status buffs. Most of them have a positive and negative effect, so you can spec out your character with a mix of artifacts to do certain things. Most of the time you start with an artifact that reduces radiation, since the artifacts with the most beneficial effects usually generate radiation while worn. The radiation reducers decrease your stamina as a side effect, so then you add a stamina boost, which decreases your resistance to shock, the most dangerous kind of anomaly to begin with. But luckily there is an artifact that offers a massive shock resistance with no penalties. That leaves you with a few slots for buffing your damage resistance. Now that I think about it, that's the only character build that really works. Each anomaly creates a certain type of artifact, and each type has different quality levels that generally become more available as you progress through the game. The higher quality ones are worth more, but also have more potent positive effects, so it can be hard to decide what to keep and what to throw away. Aside from the money to be made from selling artifacts outside the zone, rumor has it that the sarcophagus covering the power plant conceals a monolith that grants wishes. The story of Stalker is kind of predictable, but the sense of atmosphere is staggering. The zone feels mysterious, dangerous, and fascinating. In between excursions to contested areas of the zone or irradiated and dangerous disused research facilities, you spend time in Stalker safe havens. There are traders to sell artifacts to, and Stalkers sitting around the fire telling stories and playing the guitar. Aside from story dialogue from main characters, all the dialogue is left untranslated, which really helps the feeling of atmosphere. Most of the environments are based on real-world locations in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, though moved around a bit for the sake of convenience. The bunker and science facilities all feel very real, with an industrial busyness to the design. There aren't a lot of blank spaces in Stalker, everything feels handcrafted. The world isn't huge, but each area you travel between typically has side areas to explore and a mixture of long-range and close-range encounters. Each area has dozens of hidden stashes, but they're empty until you loot the stash info from a dead body, after which they're marked on your map. It's a weird system. Clear Sky did the same. Call of Pripyat finally fixed it by making the stashes a collection of real items instead of a storage container. They're available at any time, which is cool because you can stumble across them, and it incentivizes exploration. I can see why they didn't do that in Stalker, though, because once you play the game through once, you can just clear out all the stashes first thing. Or more likely, find them all using the Wikia article and tool up like the Doom Marine in the first 10 minutes of play. Aside from avoiding anomalies, the gameplay of Stalker is pretty much tactical FPS boilerplate. Ballistics are modeled accurately, which is wicked cool. Bullets drop with distance, they can ricochet, and it seems like they can penetrate some walls, but that might be an engine glitch. It could be that your target's hitbox is penetrating the wall, and your bullet isn't penetrating anything. There was a good selection of weapons, a mixture of Warsaw Pact and NATO firearms, and limited customization. Some rifles can have grenade launchers, suppressors, and scopes mounted. Stalker places an emphasis on iron sights, but weirdly, guns are still fairly inaccurate in iron sights mode. When engaging at a distance, it can be hard to tell if your shots are landing, and it occasionally is frustrating because you can't kill anything even when your sights are dead on. I'm not expecting perfect accuracy at range. I'd like bullets to go pretty much exactly where your sights are pointing. The trick is getting your sights on target. Stalker has no muzzle sway, so your sights are dead on and the gun has inherent inaccuracy. Two of the coolest guns, the FNF2000 prototype and the Gauss rifle, are only available at the very end of the game, and the game balance means the guns get steadily better as the game progresses, which does mean that early guns like the Makarov and the AKS-74U are just plain garbage. There are also some weird choices. As is typical for Eastern European games, the AR-15 platform is portrayed as being a flimsy piece of shit that can't get through a full magazine even when factory fresh and fully lubed, whereas the AK platform is rugged and manly and allows you to operate on the level of Matt V2099. To that I say, what, are you fucking high? Is it 1970 fucking 5? The AR-15 variant in the game is even an expensive, modern-day, custom AR-15 build, the ZMLR-300. It would have made much more sense to have the AR platform rifles in the game be old surplus M16s, maybe A2s, or even older. It would fit with the theme of crusty old army gear, and would let the M16 be a realistic counterpoint to the AKS-74. More customizable, easier to handle, but unpredictable. Even better if the majority of the Kalashnikovs available in the zone were older 47s and AKS rifles chambered in 7.62x39. Then it would be a crude, punchier alternative to the AR platform. As it stands, there isn't enough difference between the NATO 5.56 and the Russian 5.45 to make the rifles diverse. 
The only reason to switch from one to the other is if you run out of rifle grenades for one type of gun and not for the other. A cool feature I could stand to see more of is different ammo types. Handguns have a mix of FMJ, overpressure rounds, and even hydroshocks for the 45 ACP, and rifles have armor-piercing ammo and multiple grades of sniper rifle ammo. AP ammo is treated as universally better than military ball ammo, though, which is a bit of a simplification, but an acceptable one as almost all your enemies are clad in Kevlar and exoskeletons. Anyway, you don't want to hear me nerd out about guns and ammo for 20 minutes, so boxes. Stalker was released when physical PC game releases were dying. The digital distribution revolution hadn't really taken off yet, but people still weren't really gaming on PC. It's hard to imagine now, but PC gaming was in a bit of a hibernation in the mid-2000s. The smart gamers knew it wouldn't die because they could see consoles were basically turning into PCs anyway. If you had friends back then who insisted that PC gaming would make a return, you should apologize for calling them crazy. We'd all really appreciate it. None of this means PC games didn't get physical releases in the double lots. My point is just that they were pretty bare bones. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl comes in a double wide DVD case with some, uh, artwork on it. The cover creeped me out enough that I had to work up the nerve to buy and play the damn thing. The back cover is perfect though. Man made hell. That's a heck of a tagline. It sort of reads two ways. Hell exists in a man made environment, but it also alludes to the purposeful creation of the hell. Otherwise, good screenshots and good copy. Doesn't give away too much and points out the artificial life engine as a feature. A-Life would have made Oblivion's Radiant AI look like a bunch of retard children if it had been fully implemented. Not like they needed any help, but that's a story for another time. Inside is a threadbare manual, though the cover is nice, and a single DVD on a pluck hub that looks like it was meant to hold a stack of CDs. The UK got access to the Radiation Edition, which comes in a sick, weathered-looking steel case. It has essentially the same manual and the most useless tiny map. The excessively vertical layout of Shock's game world manifests in a skinny-ass map the size of two sheets of A2 paper stapled end-to-end. -end. The real bonuses are the Zone Survival Guide, a mini-book with art, the Marked One's diary, and info about the factions, mutants, artifacts, and weapons. There's also a bonus DVD with more stuff on it. The best part is the pictures of the zone the developers took while visiting, and a gallery comparing photos of the zone to the finished levels in the game. It's all cool, but none of it is really worth it unless you have the same kind of sickness that I do. Stalker was followed up by Clear Sky, a prequel in 2008, and Call of Pripyat in 2010. Both games are great, and in a purely technical sense are much better games than Stalker. Clear Sky adds a Faction Wars system, improved weapons customization, a much revamped artifact system, and some of the most hardware-intensive graphical effects ever in the PC game world. Seriously, if you had a Crisis rig in 2008, it would still crash and burn the second you put in the Clear Sky disc. Call of Pripyat went even further and eliminated a lot of the gameplay frustrations that were still bumming around in Clear Sky. Both are more playable games than the original, but they feel like games. Stalker is more of an adventure, more of an experience. The only thing like it is the first Half-Life. Like with Half-Life, Stalker is so anti-game, I just can't approach it the way I would an Assassin's Creed or a Battlefield. There's nothing inherently wrong with the gaminess of Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, but it does mean that Shadow of Chernobyl is more special. This is the game I remember, and this is the one I think everybody should play. GSC Game World was working on a multi-platform Stalker 2, but the company's implosion put a stop to those plans. The company was already falling apart when Stalker was released. The two programmers responsible for the X-Ray engine who left in 2005 founded their own studio, 4A Games, and made their own Stalker game, Metro 2033. In 2011, GSE Game World was dissolved and the remaining members of the team created Vostok Games and are working on a free-to-play online survival game called Cerverium. I haven't tried it yet, and it looks frankly atrocious, but that's probably just my bias against F2P games. In 2014, a company called West Games started a Kickstarter for Stalker 2. It was probably a scam and got shut down, only to move to another, much less reputable crowdfunding site. As much as I want Stalker 2 to happen, this really does look like a scam. Once you've extracted all the juice you possibly can out of the three Stalker games, I recommend you try some mods. Of all the ones I've played around with, my favorite is Oblivion Lost, which tries to put all the cut content back into Stalker and fix some of the more aggravating glitches and unfinished broken crap. Oblivion Lost re-enables a huge amount of NPC behavior, allowing them to collect items from bodies, move corpses around, and take cover from emissions. 
The unscripted emissions are also new to the game, though you see them in Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat. There are also a huge number of changes that make the game more fun. Guns are more accurate and powerful across the board. Combat in Vanilla Stalker is always a bit wonky because guns have a lot of inherent inaccuracy even in Iron Sights mode, which makes it feel like you just can't hit anything until late game when you get scoped fully automatic rifles with almost no muzzle climb. Oblivion Lost also changes the sounds the gun make, which makes them sound more realistic and less like toys. The basic Makarov starting pistol feels much less like a video game emergency pistol weapon and more like a military handgun capable of lethal force. Traders now repair weapons and armor at exorbitant expense, which means you don't have to say goodbye to unique items after you use them for a while, something which made a lot of stalkers' quest rewards seem pretty pointless. There's so much about Oblivion Lost that simultaneously makes Stalker more streamlined, but also more richly textured. It still has that homemade mod feel, but then again so does Stalker itself, so it doesn't seem out of place. When you buy something that isn't a AAA title, you're always taking something of a gamble. Finding a diamond in the rough is extremely rare, but sometimes you do find a good solid hunk of anthracite. Black, shiny, definitely better than bituminous, but maybe still a bit rough. God damn, that was one tortured carbon metaphor. Stalker isn't one of those games that you put up with because it has one good idea. It's a symphony of brilliant ideas played with a bunch of out-of-tune instruments. If you haven't played it, play it. If you have played it, play it again. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. One of the strange things about this show is that I almost never play games again after I've reviewed them. I hope that happens with Stalker because I've played through it completely an unhealthy number of times and I'd like to have my weekends back. Putting a game to rest like that is never a sad thing for me. It's a reassuring kind of closure. I assume normal people feel like this after they finish a game once. Guess it just takes me a bit longer to let go. The short version is Stalker fucking rules. Thanks for watching. See you in the zone. Твое желание скоро исполнится. Иди ко мне. Шон человек, иди ко мне.